Well, I asked before if you're ready for worship. Hopefully you're ready to hear from the Word of God and no one else. Amen? And I'm going to start with that very thing in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. You don't have to turn there. We won't be there this morning. But there's a scripture I think that's most fitting to start our time off this morning. It says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. There seems to be a lot more or it seems to be a lot more prayers as of late. More and more we hear, not just here at Grace, but outside of these four walls, about the need for healing. Healing in our homes. Healing in our communities, in our nation, and our world as a whole. Take your pick when people were highlighting the need for God to intervene in our lives People will cite personal problems. They'll cite political unrest. They'll cite a pandemic. It's just a few reasons they hope for God to intervene. In our church, I know there are a few who faithfully pray for our country and our world. Prayer that we will seek God before anything else that we will rely upon His Word instead of any political ideology or philosophical movement. Prayer that Christians are serious about their faith. But brothers and sisters in Christ, regardless of what's going on in our world, if we are not right with God, then that should be our first priority. Yes, Jesus instructed us that we should love our neighbor and that we should love others as He has loved us. But understand this, if our relationship is not right with God, then the rest is immaterial. Because we're fighting an uphill battle, and a battle that no doubt we will lose. This morning, we're going to discuss a topic where it is okay for the Christian to be selfish. Because it deals with you and your relationship with Jesus. And if it's not where it should be, the relationship, that is, then all of your focus, all of your effort, and all of your energy needs to center on that alone. On Grace's Facebook page this weekend, there was a post that stated, Get serious with Jesus now, because tomorrow may be too late. Folks, we have to keep that in perspective, because none of us are guaranteed tomorrow We're not guaranteed this evening. We're not guaranteed another hour. Let's be honest, we're not guaranteed another minute on this earth. We need to take a self-inventory and evaluate. Let me not not just make it we. Let me make it personal. You need to take a self-inventory and evaluate your closeness to God. Are you as closest to Jesus now as you have ever been? Is your faith as strong now as it has ever been? Is your life and your walk with Jesus as strong as it's ever been? In four weeks, we'll begin our spring revival meetings. And a lot of us get excited when we hear about an evangelist coming in and and we get to hear a, a different perspective on messages and It's usually a good time of of fellowship, and I would say a good time of worship. But brothers and sisters in Christ, if we long for revival, if we long for true revival, then four weeks is too far away. We can't wait four weeks for revival to take place. We don't need to wait for a brother to hop on a plane and fly in from Arkansas. We don't need a different time to meet. Revival only comes from God and the receptiveness of His people. We talk about wanting to grow closer to God pretty consistently and wanting to pursue a life of holiness. But even though that sounds really good, is it something that we mean? We sing the song, we want to know more about our Jesus. We sing the song, I will fly away. But let me ask you a question. 
Are you ready right now? Are you close enough to God right now for that to take place? Not some distant time in the future, but right now. For some of us, we are doing everything we possibly can just to maintain. For some of us, just to maintain making the bills. For some of us, just maintaining to go another day because life has beaten us down. For others, we're just trying to maintain some form of relationship with God. For some of us, we are so eat up with fear and frustration about our lives, about our family, about our community, our church, our country, our world, that we have become exhausted. Mentally, emotionally, and physically. And if I asked each of you individually and probably collectively, you would probably tell me that you, in fact, desire to see revival take place. What Christian does not want to see a mighty movement of the Holy Spirit? Because if you're, if you're passive about that, well, then something's wrong. But what are we doing to see that revival actually takes place? Not just revival meetings, but the revival of people's hearts. What are you personally doing to see that revival takes place in your life? If you have your Bibles, I ask that you scroll or you turn with me. We're going to go to a very familiar psalm when talking about revival. We're going to be going to Psalm 85. And we're going to begin reading in verse 1, and we'll read all 13 verses. So when you get to Psalm 85, verse 1, shout out an amen. Psalm 85, verse 1. Here's what God's Word tells us this morning. Lord, Thou hast been favorable unto Thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin. Selah. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. Turn us, O God, of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Verse 6. Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. I will hear what God, the Lord, will speak. For he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. But let them not turn again to folly. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him. That glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good and our land shall yield her increase. And verse 13 says, Righteousness shall go before him and shall set us in the way of his steps. Church, let's pray this morning. Father, I am thankful for your graciousness. I am thankful for your mercy. Father, I am thankful for every blessing that you bestow upon me. Father, I stand before this congregation this morning in hopes that I do nothing that hinders anyone's worship. Father, that I do nothing that offends a soul. But Father, then I am put right back into the perspective that any time your word is shared, people should be challenged. People will more than likely be offended. But Father, I pray this morning that by the movement of the Holy Spirit, that hearts are challenged in an effort to encourage and to strengthen and to revive the hearts of the saints. Father, I pray this morning for those who may be in here that does not have a relationship with you, those who may be watching along online who may not have a relationship with you. Father, I pray that you touch them in a way that no other person can. Father, I pray this morning that you speak to our hearts. Help us understand the need for revival. 
Help us have the desire to run and grow closer to you. Father, let us not be comfortable with lackadaisical faith. Father, rather, challenge us, convict us of sin that may be separating us from you. Father, help us correct the error of our ways as we try to pursue a life of holiness. Father, help us be serious about faithfully following Christ. Father, I thank you, I praise you, and I love you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray these things. Church, say it with me. Amen. There are hundreds and hundreds, if not maybe thousands, of books that have been written about revival. How to prepare for revival. How to promote revival. How revival takes place and how to get revival to linger once it occurs. Some of them, I'm sure, are good books, but the truth is, there is really only one book that you and I need if we want real revival to take place, and that is God's Word, amen? You see, there is no word of man that can bring about real revival. The best evangelist, the best pastor, the best preacher, the best teacher can do everything within their might and everything within their power, but the fact of the matter is, it is still in vain if God is not in it. Amen? Some of them, I'm sure, books that is, give truthful things and perspectives about revival. But once again, there is no word of man that can bring about true revival. Sure, the word of man can invoke a sense of some type of religious experience. Seeing somebody that, that you connected with from a previous time that, that you sat through in revival meetings, sure, they may bring about some sense of nostalgia. But that doesn't mean true revival takes place. Man's word can draw out and even generate an outpouring of human emotion, causing tears to come to the eye, causing you to reflect upon your life. But man's word cannot cause revival to come. Amen? British evangelist G. Campbell Morgan once said this, Revival cannot be organized, but we can set ourselves to catch the wind from heaven when God chooses to blow upon His people once again. This morning, I hope that is what all of us will do. Set ourselves in preparation for God and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Because, as I said before, if you're truly a follower of Jesus Christ this morning, and I asked you one-on-one, -on -one, do you desire true revival to take place? I'm pretty confident in saying everyone would say they want that to happen. But in order to do that, there are some things that we have to personally do. How can we do that? Well, we can see a clear outline for revival preparation in our text this morning in Psalm 85. We will break this psalm down into four parts, and I won't keep you long this morning. But it provides insight to laying the groundwork for the movement of God and for the revival of His people. The title of the message this morning is, Are You in Need of Revival? Are you in need, personally, in need of revival? Let's look at this, uh, let's look at this psalm. The first action we can see in Psalm 85, we see the psalmist take is to give God praise. To give God glory. Praise is given. Psalm 85, 1 through 3, I'll read those again. Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sins, Selah. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. I've said this a couple of times and I'll say it again. God is more than worthy of our praise this morning. When considering the people of Israel, you can see that the start of this psalm talks about God being favorable toward them. To thy land, which means that God's purposes for Israel was to occupy the promised land, which we've talked about a lot in our journey with Joshua, as well as remain committed to his covenant, which we, we also highlighted in, in Joshua chapter 1. 
You want to make note here that the psalmist calls the land God's, but does not stay consistent in continuing to call it God's land throughout the psalm. We'll talk about that here in a few minutes. If you're alive in the house this morning, or you're watching along somewhere else, God has shown you favor. Let me say that one more time. If you are living and breathing this morning, God has shown you favor. You can't get around that. You can try to say that you don't believe in his existence. But the fact of the matter is there is no scientific theory. There is no philosophical viewpoint that can explain origin of life, explain the sustainability of life, or explain why we have a desire to constantly fill a void that is missing in our life. Because even the person who by definition of a human being, is the wealthiest, has everything money can buy, has all the friendships anybody could ever want, has all the, uh, uh, all the, um, uh, uh, all the attention that they could ever need. Even those people will say there is something still missing. I talked to someone once who was at the top of the, uh, top of the mountain in terms of their field. They were wealthy, They had some notoriety. They were pseudo-famous. And you know what they said? They said, when I got to the top, you know what I found? Nothing. No matter what science tells us, no matter what a philosopher will tell us, even the philosophers out there on Facebook who give you life advice for free, nobody can tell you how to fill that void that's missing in your life. When something just doesn't seem right, when something seems amiss, when things don't add up. You want to know what's missing? It's that uh, that relationship with Jesus. If you're alive this morning, God has shown you favor. Verse 2 goes on to declare that God has taken away the iniquities from the people. And understand this, God just does not stop. At that, but he also covers them up. By covering you of the transgressions in your life, you have been absolved of any consequences that may befall you, anything that you would have faced. God's word tells us what about those transgressions? What does God's word tell us about the iniquity in our life? It tells us that the wages of sin. The price you must pay for sin is what? Is death. Amen? However, because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, those sins can be covered if you put your faith in Him. And you, and your record is completely expunged if you rely upon Jesus Christ. If you're a follower of Jesus this morning, you are not only favored by God, not only have your sins been washed in the blood of the Lamb, but God uh, God has turned His wrath from you. That is because the faith you have in Christ has restored your personal relationship with Him. God has shown you favor. All of these things make God worthy of your praise. And in order for us to prepare for real revival, we have to remember all the things that God has done. I've said that to you a lot over the past couple of months, remembering the things that God has done. Because it's very easy to become discouraged. It's very easy to become disenfranchised. It's very easy... To simply just come to worship service and then go along as if God is changing nothing in your life. The fact of the matter is, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ this morning, then you should be able to easily identify areas in which God has shown you favor. Obstacles He has helped you overcome. Discouragement He has helped you get through. God has aided you in the past. Proverbs uh, Proverbs 10 verse 7 says this, The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. That means when you recall on past times, we're not saying everything. We're not saying there's no such thing as a bad memory. But understand, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, when you reflect upon your life, you should be able to see a lot of good. 
the memory of the just is blessed. We should thank God for all that He has done and continues to do in our life. No matter how small the blessing may be, God deserves the thanks and the praise for it. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20 tells us this, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord, or our Lord, Jesus Christ. If we want real revival to take place, then guess what? Revival has to get personal. And that means it could get uncomfortable. But we can long and we can say we want revival. And we can act as if we are looking forward to revival. But if we don't make revival about us, then it's just talk. It's just lip service. If you don't make revival about you personally, then it doesn't matter what desires you have. Because revival is about revival of the saint's heart. We want revival, or we should want revival for ourselves. We must start. If we want that, we must start by acknowledging that God has done mighty things in our lives. What has He done for you? Can you answer that question? If I were to ask Brother Chris to come out of the sound room here and bring a microphone, and I ask for a volunteer to come up and say, what has God done for you? Would you be able to quickly recall something and be able to tell us about God's goodness? And not from ten years ago, but from this week from today or would that be a challenge for you God is worthy of praise how has God blessed you if you struggle to answer how has God shown you favor and how God has blessed you if you cannot think of any blessings that God has bestowed upon you lately then recall the ones you can and know that you are in desperate need of revival if you look at your life and you say you know what there's just things that don't add up It just seems a lot harder than it used to be. Life just isn't the way it used to be. That's not a a, a pulling of the strings on nostalgia because everybody who tries to act like things are so bad will always tell you how great you had it years and years ago. Politicians are wonderful at that, by the way. But I mean this morning, if you can't say confidently that God is blessing your life, then you're in need, you're in desperate need of revival. In order for real revival to take place, we have to make it personal. You have to make it personal. You have to long for it in your heart. You have to be honest with God first and then honest with yourself to know that you are in need of revival. You have to be self-aware enough to know your present condition and take it to God. And that's the second action we can see in Psalm 85 this morning. Is the psalmist knowing the present condition. Here's where I get that. We'll start in verse 4. Turn us, O God of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. Will thou be angry with us forever? Will thou draw out thine anger, uh, 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 anger to all generations? Will thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. You see, the psalmist, if you were to look at what's taking place here, no doubt the land had already been delivered. God had already moved. We talked about that in the first couple of verses. A lot of commentators will tell you in this psalm that this was a period of time that was a part of a a national embarrassment. There, There was something major that took place And they all felt as if God had turned their back on them. Well, look at our world today. If I say, do you think our country is an embarrassment, no matter what side of the aisle you're on, and this is not the area for political commentary, no matter what side of the aisle you're on, no matter where you're at, most people believe that we're in in pretty rough shape as a country and as a world. Aren't these verses so applicable to us? But let's get past that. Remember, we're we're making it personal. We're making revival personal right now. Is this the happiest you've ever been in your life? Wait a minute. Happiness is an emotion. Let me go back to my original question. Is this the closest you've ever been to God is right now? Because if not, 
you're in desperate need of revival. In order for revival to take place, you have to realize that you are in a place that requires mercy from God. And I don't know about you, but I wake up every morning thankful that I get mercy from God. Because if God were to rain down His judgment upon me daily, I wouldn't be here. And neither would you, by the way. You cannot cruise along thinking that being out of alignment with God is not detrimental to you. You can't get along or go along thinking that, you know what, I'm just going to take a week or so where I'm not going to read my Bible. I'll read it again in church. I'm going to take a, I'm going to take a couple of weeks from worshiping in any form. I'm going to take some time just for me to focus on me. Because you know what happens? Slowly, after time, you, dr you, you drift further and further and further away from God. I had surgery in 2015, and I can remember telling my wife, man, I can't wait. I'm going to get six, eight weeks off of work, Brother Randy. I'm, I'm going I'm to study my Bible every day. I'm going to be in it and committed. And I'd like to tell you, I grew spiritually, exponentially every single day. But let's get back to reality. Here's what happened. Because of the surgery, I wasn't able to worship. And because of the fact that they suppressed my immune system to such a state where they almost practically wanted me in a bubble, I wasn't able to have visitors. Now, my family was there, of course, but here's the thing. At first, I stopped worshiping. That's okay. I'll still read my Bible from time to time. Then the people that I was close, close with spiritually, other than my wife, I didn't really get time to visit with them. So I let those relationships fall. I didn't even try to continue them through phone. Then after a while, what came next? Ah, you know what? I can read my Bible tonight instead of this morning. Oh, I'll get it tomorrow even though I missed it today. Oh, I'll pick it up tomorrow. And all of a sudden, fast forward six to eight weeks, and I just couldn't figure out why in the world things just didn't seem right. And I chalked it up that it was my health. Maybe I just wasn't feeling that hot after surgery. And there might have been some truth to that. But the bigger issue was, is I was in desperate need of revival because I was slowly sinking away from God. And I was allowing any and everything to get in the way of my relationship with Him. Understand this. We can say we don't have a need for worship. But if you don't worship your relationship suffers. You can say that you have no need to have Christian friends and people who are close to you, but guess what? If you don't have those people there to challenge you, to encourage you, to hold you accountable, that is detrimental to your relationship with God. If you can say, you know what, I don't need, I, I get my verse of the day on the phone. There's a, there's a couple of you who tell me that from time to time. That one verse of the day, hey, that's better than nothing. Amen and amen. But if you don't have real time with God's word, that is detrimental to your relationship with God. Allowing sin, no matter how seemingly small, even allowing yourself to become distracted and forget what is most important, which is God, by the way, can be harmful to you, your family, your church, and even further past that. But remember, this is about making revival personal. So let's stick with you. You have come to a place where you realize that there is sin that is undealt with in your life. And the sin could simply be allowing the distractions to hinder your relationship with God. Do you need accountability? Is there sin that has been undealt with for so long in your life? So long, in fact, that now it just seems like, oh, it'll be okay. It's just a part of life. God understands. I've heard that before. God understands what I'm going through. Okay. Do you need accountability? Can you even be honest with yourself about your condition and your relationship with God? Because that's a hard thing to do. It's easy for us to point out sin in people we don't know, even better in people we do know. But if we ever get to the point where we're judging our righteousness by our neighbor's sin, we're in a bad way. We're in a very, very bad way. In the spring of 1995, revival broke out in a lot of college campuses in America. And, and, 
And it's unusual for a place, of all places, for revival to take places to be on college campuses. Right now, as a matter of fact, if you were to ask me where it's likely for revival to break out, college campuses would probably be almost last on, on the list. But in 1995, in the spring of 1995, revival was breaking out in college campuses. And, and one characteristic of this visitation from God was that students were dealing directly with their own personal sinful habits. They weren't talking about it in generalities. They weren't talking about their friends or their neighbors or the college uh, uh, you know, on, in, in the other town neighboring to them. They were talking about their own personal shortcomings. A lady named bon, uh, Bonnie Stephan interviewed several of the students for their, uh, a publication called The Christian Reader. And one student named Brian at Asbury College said this, I was a leader on campus, a Christian leader on campus. We had invited Wheaton students to come out and share, and at first I was praying for other people, but then I began to think about my own struggles. I stood in line for three hours with one of my best friends, all the time thinking, how can I stand up here and admit I'm less than perfect. But I also realized that being a Christian or on a Christian campus isn't protection from the world. I have really struggled with lust and I found I wasn't alone. It was an issue for a lot of others and personally, I wanted the chain to be broken. I wanted that out of my life. And if it meant no magazines, no television, I was willing to eliminate it. If it meant changing of relationships... I was willing to eliminate it. And a number of us agreed to come in, 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 together and hold one another accountable. My deepest desire was to be pure in my heart and my thoughts. And understand this, as this student shows the desire in his particular situation, the desire for purity is beginning or is the beginning of purity. You can't get something without having the desire for it. Purity comes when we pursue it actively and forcefully. Now, this morning you may not struggle with that particular type of lust, but you can relate. What is important in understanding is that no matter what you're hoping to achieve, it all begins with desire. You can desire money because you love it. You can desire more things because there's a void in your life you're trying to fill. You can desire someone other than your spouse because of your lust. These are all things that lead to sin. Why? Because it all started with desire. But let's go to the other side of that coin. The same is applicable to longing for God and a stronger relationship with Him as well. Instead of longing for sin, you can desire for revival to take place, desiring to do the will of God and following His word leads to revival. Psalm 19 verse 7 says this, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. That word converting there in Psalm 19 in the original Hebrew means to turn back. To return to a previous state. And if you cannot confidently say that this right now, this moment in time, is the closest you have ever been to God. But your goal and your hope should be is to get back to that closest point and continue to grow. If you can say this morning to yourself, to God, you know what, I know that I'm further away from you than I've been in the past. Guess what? If you can be that honest with yourself and that honest with God, you are on the path to revival. But you have to desire it. It has to be something you long for. Not a series of meetings, not a particular evangelist, not anything but a revival of your heart, a restoring of that relationship, a need to be closer to God. Psalm 85 verse 8 says this, I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for He will speak peace unto His people and to His saints, but let them not turn again to folly. You know what that means? At one point, they were in a bad way. They grew closer to God, but here, the psalm is telling us they have the potential to go back to folly, go back to foolishness, go back to the things of this world. 
The third action we can see the psalmist take is professing his plans for what he will do when God moves. See, he's not even questioning if God will bring about a movement. He's not questioning if revival is possible. In fact, he is committing to what he will do when it takes place. That is something that you need to do. If you long for revival, then you should be making some commitments to God of what will change in your life. You should be present, or rather, uh, uh, you should have an idea in your mind, something that you think about, that you pray over, that you need God to deal with, and that you personally need to deal with uh, as well. You should present the position that you are going to take And know when you see the movement of God take place that you will commit to that action. A.W. Tozer once said, Have you noticed how much praying for revival has been going on of late and how little revival has resulted? I believe the problem is is that we have been trying to substitute praying for obeying and it simply will not work. Prayers work, amen? Amen. But the fact of the matter is is if we pray and we desire and we long for revival and we see that God moves upon us and then we do absolutely nothing after it, if the obedient actions do not follow, then what's the purpose of all the praying and desire? It is my opinion that most Christians want the appearance of revival without the heart change. They want the feel goods without the change of conduct. We want God to bless us, but we don't want to serve. We like the mantra that we love and obey God's word and that our worldview is built on sound doctrine, yet we don't adhere to God's word. We want sermons that motivate and encourage, but not to be bogged down by the word of God or a message that challenges us. We want the experience without the faithfulness or devotion. Chart out your time over the next week. No doubt all of us have full calendars. How much time have you set aside for God? Well, an hour or two on Sunday, maybe an hour Wednesday night. Yeah, the rest of my calendar is pretty much full. And how many of us are like that? Quite a bit. We want the experience without the faithfulness or devotion. We have to be serious about how our lives are going to be conducted, our worship and our service, what it will look like if God blesses us with revival. James chapter 4 verse 8 says, Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. The same book, James chapter 1 verse 25 says, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. You have to make a sincere commitment to God in order for revival to take place. And that sincere commitment is accompanied by how you see your walk with Jesus being from here on out. Because if your thought is, I want a revival experience where I'm overcome with emotion, where I feel good, but you don't have any plans past that point, you're not desiring real revival. You're desiring the equivalent of a good movie, a roller coaster, a song that you just love to sing along to in the car. You're not desiring real and true revival. Psalm 85, verse 9. Surely His salvation is nigh them that fear Him. That glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good and our land shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before him and shall set us in the way of his steps. The final act that we see in Psalm 85 is complete faith and trust that God is going to move that God is going to make a difference in your life 
for real revival to take place, you have to prepare for it to come. And not in four weeks when Brother Derek Stinnett gets here. Not next week because you know what? There's some things you'd like to do that probably wouldn't honor God as well as much. No. You want to know when you need to be ready for revival? Right now. Right this second. We don't have to wait until April 4th. Revival is possible today. If your heart and my heart is ready for it. And the Lord decides to grant it. What would happen if real revival took place today? Tomorrow, April 4th, whenever. What would that look like? Well, the final three verses, uh, verses of Psalm 85 make it pretty clear what it will look like and what will happen. The first, truth will spring out of the earth. You know what that means? Is that God's people will be faithful to Him. The truth will be proclaimed by us from the earth. That's the first thing. The second thing, righteousness shall look down from heaven, meaning God cares for you from above. He takes interest in your life. He knows you intimately and desires a stronger relationship with you. That will only grow stronger if revival takes place. You want to know why that grows stronger? You could be the most backslidden Christian in here this morning. You could be an unbeliever and not have given your life to Jesus Christ. God still takes interest in you. Understand this. But you want to know what makes the relationship stronger is recognizing and knowing in your heart that God takes a personal interest in you and what you do. The third thing, the Lord shall give that which is good. God's Word tells us what that means in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 6, verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You see, if you're within the will of God, if you're pursuing a life of holiness, if you're doing what He has called you to do, and if you're where He has led you to be, understand that blessings will be poured out on you. Not exempt from trial and tribulation, But that strength, that relationship that you have will carry you through anything. Fourth, when the bread of life is sowed throughout our land, the church shall yield its increase. Meaning if real revival takes place, then the people will be so on fire. You personally will be so on fire for God that others recognize and want to understand where passion comes from. I talked about this this past week during Wednesday night Bible study. But a lighthouse has no reason to blare loud sirens. A lighthouse has no reason to have someone who has to go down in front of it and hold a sign to say, this is a lighthouse. No, a lighthouse simply shines a light and allows people to course correct or leads people where to go. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if we are true followers of Jesus then we are the lighthouse that should be directing people where to go. And where should we be directing them? Straight to the cross. That is where we should be directing them to go. Fifth, God will go before us and guide our steps. He does that for the Christian now, by the way. But if your relationship with Jesus weakens, then you find it harder to follow in God's footprints or you lack the desire altogether to stay within the will of God. When revival truly takes place, we will look to Him to guide us and no one else. We will ask where He wants us to be. Andrew Murray wrote, The coming revival must begin with a great revival of prayer. It is in the closet with the door shut, that the sound of abundance of rain will first be heard. An increase of secret prayer will bring about a blessing. Tom Rainer wrote in his book, Great Awakenings, or excuse me, uh, uh, Giant Awakenings, that 71% of breakout churches report an increased emphasis on prayer over the past several years as compared to only 40% of churches which continued on the plateau, meaning the churches And the people that make up our churches, the ones who see real revival, the ones who see spiritual growth, pray more. Imagine that. 
in his study of prayer and revivals from 1726 to present day, a gentleman by the name of Earl Carnes notes the found, profound simplicity that prayer ranks first in the coming revival. At each renewal began, each renewal of faith began with prayer groups. He says prayer preceded the Scottish revival of 1742 and 1839. And also Moody, Chapman and other 19th century persons had many organized prayer groups praying for their work. If you want to see God move in this church, let's, let's make it personal. Let's not just talk about the church. If you want to see God move in your life, in this church, in this community, then we have to be praying. Sincerely praying. If we want genuine and true and real revival to take place, then we must pray for it. We must praise God for what He has done. We must recognize and confess that we are in need of it right now. Commit to God what we will do with it and be prepared for it to happen today. Will you pray with me this morning? Father, I am thankful for your word. I am thankful for this psalm that no doubt challenges us how to prepare for a mighty movement from you. Father, I pray this morning that we recognize that we have a need to grow closer to you no matter where we're at in our spiritual journey. Father, I pray this morning that we long for and have a desire for revival. But Father, I pray we don't just stop at a desire. Father, I pray we don't just stop at a longing. Father, I pray that we are faithful to pray to you for you to revive us again. Father, I pray that if there's anyone in the house this morning who does not know you, that the reading of your word and the movement of the Holy Spirit has challenged them to surrender their life to you. And Father, I just pray they do that this morning. Father, I thank you, I praise you, and I love you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray all of these things. Amen.